right, EP Stats. Hope you guys are doing a great, having a great, oh my gosh, clearly it's early for me. My brain's not working yet. However, I hope you have a great day or had a great day, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, we are moving on to 4.2 of the practice of statistics, the fourth edition. Um, and we're going to be talking about two different types of studies. We have observational studies and experiments. Um, so basically, our job today is to distinguish between the two. What's an observational study? What's an experiment? Um, we're going to talk about lurking variables and confounding variables. Um, don't get hung up too much on the difference between the two. Um, and identify the experimental units or subjects, uh, explanatory variables, treatments, and response variables in experiment. So I'm sorry ahead of time, but this is just like a heavy vocab day. Um, I highly recommend writing it down because it's just a lot of vocab. And eventually you'll kind of get the hang of it and you won't need to like look up the words anymore, but I don't know. It's just, just vocab. Sorry, I'll be, try to be as exciting as possible. Okay, so number one, uh, observes individuals and measures variables of interest, but does not attempt to influence the responses. So basically this is you watch people or um, whatever, you're, whatever you're observing, animals, plants, medication, um, people, you're watching it and you're not trying to influence anything. Um, you're just trying to observe like what is happening over time or what happens um, as temperature increases to birds chirping, something like that. Um, you would never, like you don't, you don't impose anything on the subjects of your study. Um, so this is called an observational study, self-explanatory. You're observing, you're studying, you're not doing anything except observing. Um, and the purpose is to describe a, a group or situation, compare groups, examine relationships, um, and that's about that's about it. We're gonna um, eventually we'll talk about scope of inference and like basically that means like what can you actually conclude from certain certain studies and like how you actually do the studies. But we'll talk about that later. So observational study, you can never infer cause and effect from an observational study. Okay, the second one is when you actually change something. Um, you deliberately impose a treatment um, on individuals to measure their responses. Um, and the purpose of this is to determine whether or not a treatment causes a change in the response. Um, uh, this is an experiment. Um, so experiments have to have a treatment. You are imposing something in on the subjects, uh, on your, on the individuals within the, stu in the study, and trying to see if there's a change happening. Um, you tell people to take drugs, and then you have a group with with drugs and a group with placebos, um, and you try to see how the drugs affect, uh, how they affect the group. Okay, so this next one, there's like the vocab word here, but there's also two vocab words in the ex in the like description here. So you have explanatory variable and a response variable. Um, so let's read the thing and we'll talk about it. So um, this thing is a variable not among the explanatory variable or response variables in a study, but uh, that may influence the response variable. Um, so number one is the explanatory variable is um, if you have taken any sort of math class it's also the independent variable um, it goes on the x-axis because it explains what's happening in as a response um, so if it helps explanatory has an x in it so it goes on the x-axis Okay, it's your x variable, the explanatory variable, and the response variable responds to the explanatory variable, therefore it's the dependent variable, it is on the y-axis. Okay, um, but that's important, and the book um, also calls the explanatory variable a factor, 
uh, just another term. I don't use it too often, but I use explanatory response more, but just so you know what that terminology is. Anyways, so this is an additional variable. So you think that um, smoking causes lung cancer, right? Your explanatory variable is smoking and your response variable is cancer. Um, there may be some other variable that affects or causes lung cancer that smokers also have in common um, that you think is, um, that you don't even realize is like actually causing the lung cancer, but you think it's the smoking, but it's not actually the smoking that causes lung cancer. It's something else. Um, and so that something else is called a lurking variable. Um, a lurking variable is something that you're not sure if it's going to affect it, but it might. Um, and so you just kind of want to pay attention to like, what are some things that might affect uh, the results of this, you know, the responses of this, this study. Okay, confounding occurs when two variables are associated in a way such that their effects on a response variable cannot be distinguished from each other. Um, a lurking variable, note that that is a change in the notes there. Um, a lurking variable is a potential confounding variable, okay? So here's the deal. Um, I'm going to give you an example of, um, say we wanted to test uh, if caffeine affects heart rate, um, and we decide to give uh, half of the class like Pepsi and the other, cat, the other half of the class um, decaffeinated um, Pepsi. The thing, so you may have a result um, where the group that has had the Pepsi, um, the regular Pepsi, increases their heart rate. Um, but it may not be the caffeine and the Pepsi because both groups, the, um, the Pepsi and the uh, decaf, both might have sugar or they both might have like chemicals that would increase your heart rate or maybe the fact that you're in an experiment gets you really excited and you're like oh my god i'm in an experiment and then like your <gasps> heart rate goes up okay so the, all of those things that might also cause your heart rate to go up would be lurking variables um and then if you do the experiment and you find that it was in fact one of those other things. That is a confounding variable. So a confounding variable is it actually affects the results of your study. Lurking variable are potential confounding variables. Um, I wouldn't worry too terribly much about the difference between the two. Um, it's just, you know, bad things happen. Um, and a good visual here is um, if I have like if I think that X causes Y, right? I think that, and I perform a study that tries to figure that out or to prove it. Um, there might be some other factor Z that actually causes Y um, that I haven't thought about or that I haven't controlled for. Um, and the thing that has to be true about confounding variables is like this group of X, like this explanatory variable has to kind of coincide with this other variable. Um, it can't just be like, I don't know. Um, if I think, if I'm doing the Pepsi experiment, right? Um, I can't just assume that like, the like some of the kids had high heart rates because they have a test the next period um it has to directly coincide with like the pepsi so if x is pepsi then z has to go along with the pepsi or the caffeine <clears throat> actually this would be our caffeine uh we would think that you know maybe it was actually the sugar not the caffeine that affected the heart rate Okay, um, and so these two things have to coincide. Like you have to, the people who have X also have Z. Okay, 
Um, so we'll, we'll do a couple examples so you kind of get the hang of that a little bit better. Okay, last three vocab words are pretty easy. Um, the condition applied to the individuals in an experiment. Um, uh, this is the treatment. So you, you treat individuals in an experiment and you try to see what their responses are to it. Uh, so that's treatment. Um, the individuals in an experiment um, are called experimental units. Uh, and then if we have people, it's a little um, like dehumanizing to call them units. So we call them subjects of an experiment. Okay, so let's move on to the examples. Um, so you can go ahead and read those, see if you can answer them yourselves, um, and then we'll go over them together. Okay, so I realized that the second example is like the exact same thing that I just talked about. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. I guess it's a common um, experiment that I think about because it's easy, has easy lurking variables. Um, anyways, so hopefully you're able to answer B pretty easily. Um, a uh, asks which is an experiment and which is an observational study. Um, or how would you answer these questions? Um, so one asks two questions. Um, the first one is, does alcohol impair schoolwork? And what is the typical age a person starts drinking? Two very different questions, both about drinking. Um, however, one would be an experiment and the other one is an observational study. First one is an experiment. Second one is an observational study. So in this one, you'd have to like give a treatment, which is alcohol. You'd have to like, split people up into groups, uh, make them drink. Morals are questionable in this case, like can't really make people drink. Um, and uh, you know, you gotta make sure everybody's over age and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so does alcohol impair school work? You give a group alcohol, you give another group no alcohol, and you see how they do at school. Um, and then what is the typical age a person starts drinking? And that's just an observational study. So you do a survey or you look at some data that you find online, um, et cetera. Uh, and then two, the smoking cause lung cancer versus what percentage of uh, US adults smoke? First one, in theory, should be um, an experiment. Um, it would be best done as an experiment. Does smoking cause lung cancer? But, Again, we have to kind of talk about like morals and like treating people well. So you don't, you can't like force people to smoke for 50 years and see how many of them come out with lung cancer. Um, so <laughs> this actually, the reason that they were able to answer this question, even without an experiment, is because they saw a common trend over many, many, many years, um, very, very strong evidence that like, even from an observational study, very, very strong evidence that like people who smoke a lot really tend to get a lot, you know, have high percentage of lung cancer. Um, and people who don't smoke a lot tend to not have lung cancer. Um, so this would normally be an experiment, but because you can't force people to smoke, not an experiment, but it should be. Um, and what percentage of U.S. adult smoke, that would be an observational study. You're just observing what happens in the real world. Um, and then for B, does caffeine affect pulse rate? We kind of already talked about this. Um, could we use these results? No, because we have um, a lot of different lurking variables uh, and confounding variables. So that's your answer to number two. I already talked about that. Um, and three, if it is an experiment, um, identify the treatment and individuals. So the treatment would be um, the uh, cola with caffeine um, and the individuals or subjects would be the students that you're studying. Um, and then just a quick AP tip. Um, if you're asked to identify a possible confounding variable, you're expected to explain how the variable is associated with the explanatory variable. Okay, so remember what I said um, about like X and Z having to like coincide, like they both have to happen in the same instances in order for them to be confounding variables. Um, so you would have to say why they're related um, and how does it affect the response. 
Um, you don't want to say wealth is compounding variable. You want to say people with more money tend to have better doctors and better health care and therefore will have longer life expectancies. And that's it.